One of my most biggest influences and favorite poets is William Butler Yeats. In that great poem, Easter 1916 says, we thought we had but lived where motley is worn, the dress of the clown, comedy. All's changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. And that famous refrain about the Irish revolutionaries. I'm more interested in the terrible beauty and in tragic vision. Um, this first poem I want to read is about a former boyhood friend. Uh, we used to stick up for each other in the playgrounds and things like that. Then someone told me he was murdered when I went back to San Diego. The poem's titled, I Wasn't There. When they murdered Charles Cunningham, my first best friend, I was 500 miles north of the Aztec drive-in theater where they found him on his knees, leaning on a metal stand, face white as painted speakers, dotting the acres like markers at Normandy or Arlington. Charles might have smiled a little, licked his lip, he may have thought some adolescent insult or challenge was an act until he closed with two of them, whoever they were, and a blade slid into him and twisted toward his heart. I have an alibi. I wasn't there to stand beside him as a huge screen took the colors broken from a beam of light and painted heroes up in front of him. I would have been asleep at my cousin's house, oaks, redwoods, pines. The great horned owl and deer rustled around me all that night as Charles's blood pooled beneath him on the asphalt where he knelt before some stupid melodrama. An usher caught him in a flashlight's beam and gently shook a shoulder, touched his throat. But there was nothing anyone could do for Charles Cunningham. The poet, I had these all in order and I got them all out of order. How did I do that? Uh, the poet James Welsh a Native American poet and novelist. He is best known for his novels. He's a tremendous guy. And after many a drop was drunk, we were down on the kitchen floor and he was teaching me this Blackfoot chant where I could then assume the powers of the bear. <laughs> bear song. James Welsh and I were very drunk. He got down on all fours, chanting a blackfoot brown bear song. Wind nudged the kitchen doors. Dizzily we swayed on the rough tiles, reddening beneath our knees, and did not see the moon's effects glowing through the banked trees. We grunted, rolling our bleared eyes glancing at our bare arms, as though a thick fur sprouted there, invoked by magic charms. Bare teeth and claws threaded by chains, formations of firebirds painted on Jim's sports shirt, the smoke of sweet grass mixed with words. The family cat pushed through and stopped, his fur stood up like quills. And then he streaked through the backyard on grass where the moon spills herself continuously through a bodice's ripped silk, black against the bare white skin. Some spots seem drenched with milk.
Ah, uh, here's what I want. I played football uh, all the way through high school and one year at Fresno State. And this poem is called Running with the Elephants. A real elephant can do about 45 miles an hour, <laughs> but the metaphor is that you're slow. Everyone else is faster, lighter. Our bulk, our bibs of sweat make us seem like different animals. Gudgel kneels on the grass, his helmet still on and spews. Rod sings to himself, snapping his fingers, his beer belly foaming over his buckle. My heavy pants bounce, my heels blister in the new cleats. I need water, shade. I need to rest beneath the trees where the backs who lapped us sit on lacing shoes. No one laughs at us, imitates the way we run, because tomorrow we'd knock the air from them, make them gasp like punctured tires. I love the way my body takes the shock the way my thick legs drive when I catch a back on my shoulder and root him out. Later, in the locker room, we look into mirrors without armor, smearing our combs with pomade. We're pale, 20 pounds lighter, 16 years old. In a few minutes, we'll step from the gym into the sunlight blinking, heads down, our huge trunks swaying as we walk. Fortunately, I retired early. <laughs> this poem is called Owl. It's from my third book, Legend. It's composed in rhyme royal which is a form Chaucer used in Troilus and Cressida, and Shakespeare uses in The Rape of Lucrece. Seven line stanza with double rhyme quatrain, quat, no, doubly rhymed uh, couplets, which gives it great stanzaic integrity. You could almost take these stanzas and move them around, despite what the narrative progression is. In the first two lines of this poem, uh, they're italicized, and I guess it's like the voice of the superego. Owl. A smoky mirror colder than a lake can spread your face like silver on a wave. White lips above the swaying waters break their wings through a dark air, which I engrave with my pale markings Though I try to save myself from all reflection when a crown of lights winks in the blue and seems to drown. Part two. My bathrobe opens in a sudden gust. Its gray silk puffs around the shoulders. Black lines run down the sleeves, white down at my chest. I'm at the window, fingers in the crack, where cold air issues as I hunch my back to lift and see thorn branches whip the air, wind ruffling the light plumage of my hair, wind wearing at the skin of temple and jaw of the owl who dives into my moonlit yard and the wings splash on the mouse stuck with straw. When he rises, I think I see eyes starred like cut glass, and I try to disregard these heavy bones, move like the owl, the shark of night, and pick whatever is from the dark.
This is a book that Palmer published by me, Separate Lives. I'm going to read some poems from here. This poem is called Phosphor. It's about a very cruel nun who was Irish, and her skin was so white, it was like white metal. Uh, she, it was, she was a blessing because she made me bring resources out of myself that I didn't know existed. I resisted. I was 10 years old. And it was at an orphanage where we were, you know, under their power. I love that orphanage. It wasn't bad, except you had to fight everybody all of the time. <laughs> I didn't like that. Phosphor. In a classroom, we hold up sheets of music. We chant in Latin with changing voices because she thinks I am the gentlest. Sister Angela picks me out when I can't get the right tone or pitch. She puts her face to my face, sing, sing. The wen on her cheek quivers on a skin so white it almost seems like phosphorus. I know she'll hit me in a second, but nothing will make me sing now. It is during moments such as this that one makes promises to oneself. I place my hand on the flat of anger's blade and tell myself I will never again accept another's violence. When she banishes me to homeroom forever, I read Newsweeks in the classroom next door and trace on folding maps those black arrows where the Marines were landing at in Sean. In daydreams of that war, I did not think of the white fragments glowing stuck to skin, but I thought again and again of Angela, of her metallic skin infused with heat, glowing in my mind like phosphor or lucifer, the morning star erased by a rising sun. My cousin, who I grew up with, he's more like a brother, drank himself to death. In this poem, I, ozone depletion makes us vulnerable to uh, ultraviolet rays. And the news of the death of a loved one makes us vulnerable to another kind of pain. Like ozone. Night after night, his head went down by eight o'clock. And the dim light from his clock radio would guide him to his bed and play all night. No one would ask him why he drank so much. No one would say, it's time to stop, drink water, cleanse with sweat, and end this semi-mortal crime. All of us, relatives and friends, would watch this, even drink with him at times, say nothing till the pain his eyes cupped spilled over the brim. But there's a price we pay for this. And it is absence, absence stark as a whole, eaten through the blue masses of air into the dark. From whence come energies that burn the unprotected skin and blight the leaves of certain plants, pulses invisible are too too bright. This is a poem for Don, Donald Justice, uh, one of my former teachers. Uh, he was my teacher at the, in the Iowa Writers' Workshop. I really loved him. He was a terrific guy. I hadn't seen him for maybe 20 years or so, and he read at Claremont up which is just east of Los Angeles, so we drove up there for the poetry reading. I had these incredible feelings for him. It's called Poetry Reading for Don Justice. 
beneath his kindness, generosity, and gentleness, unusual strength resides. You barely hear the traces of a drawl, which if you knew such things, would document his place of birth as Florida or Georgia. Tonight, he reads his poems in a packed hall. His syllables are cut in polished stones. I know about long hours, years even, spent beneath lamplight, poring over worksheets. I know the exactions of his art have ground rough edges like a pumice stone and left the essence of the man in silences, in lines and phrases traced onto a page or the air for those who listen here tonight. The cause for what we hear can be found only in the ethos of a man who holds himself most strictly bound to what is difficult. After the reading, though we talk, laugh, drink, there is a kind of silence one might find at the hushed center of a storm, a place his voice and perfect ear have made for us. The storm is cold and chaos. It is the world. But for an hour or so, we seem to move in a charmed circle of protective light, affection warming us like the good wine. When I was 18 or 19, I was stationed at Bainbridge, Maryland, uh, and all of us were out there, hitchhike. you could hitchhike in those days, maybe you shouldn't have, but we could, uh, down to Washington, D.C., because you could drink beer in the bars there and, you know, and all that. So uh, that's what this poem's about. It's called Young Sailors on Liberty. Sometimes on Saturdays, they'd hitchhike south to Washington, D.C. There they could drink beer at 18 in the jazz clubs and mouth sweet notes, a trombone's neon sliding sank into the darkest places they could feel. And those immoral, fabled women who worked for the government might slowly trail them after closing down a street glazed blue or red by pulsing signs and gentle rains. If they could reach the park where monuments drop columns on the pools that shivered pines, why anything could happen in the dense shadows of all that foliage charged with dew. But usually nothing came of this. And sailors, like chained-up animals in the park zoo, howled, drank, till headlights of the passing cars merged with the other lights. Then they, with arms entwined, like men surviving battle, limped homeward toward a cheap hotel. Perhaps the worms of their desire anesthetized lay slumped at last in alcohol bathed by the tides and all those bottles tilted toward their lips. Some slept, a wrist above their eyes. Their needs submerged, ran swiftly in their blurring shapes. The terrible thing about the military in those days is there are hardly any women at all. And it's awful. You can't, you know, I mean, that's terrible. The next poem's called Wild Music it's for my beloved Mariana. Takes place, I have a lot of Texas poems. They're much simpler than my other, other poems. It takes place in uh, Castroville, Texas, south of here. Wild Music. 
We will return, my love, to this small town. Here the Alsatian houses are pale blue or white with metal roofs which slope down toward fenced-in plots crammed with vines, wild grasses, flowers rioting against some weathered planks. There are blue bonnets and red poppies cupping flames and cell phone photographs you took the day I posed against the splotched raw colors there. I would have picked a red bouquet for you, but a dog lurking near waited for one of us to touch his planks where blossoms scored the wood like painted notes on blown parchment. No Irish monk would emulate these staves for any illustrated manuscript. But loving their rough textures, I would play them, wondering what wild music I could spill on the air, and if they might give us a song like a tune plucked from an Aeolian harp, wind in the strings, wind in your weak gold hair. Here's a poem about Texas. I, I love it here. It's, people have been so nice. It's, it's a lot like California. There are differences, and those differences are interesting, but this is called a small town. Because the air in this small Texas town is soft and pure and leaves no grains of soot on limestone blocks exposed a hundred years or so, I think I could live here someday. I'd spot an Airstream trailer on a lot not far from the town center, stroll downtown, drink coffee with old men my age who might wear silver buckles, one in rodeos, but tarnish now. They'd push back Stetson's crease, sweat dark along the brim with scuffed up boots beneath them as they murmur through the summer heat. I'd compare this place to the red dotted towns on California maps, their Spanish names, San Luis Obispo, Mariposa, Fresno. There'd be a man who'd raise his coffee cup into a beam of light where I could see an anchor stenciled on sun-darkened skin, which webs a thumb to a finger, to a bent finger, flukes blue as seawater in those mason jars holding dead specimens boys kept too long. The tattoo's colors wash back into skin. Mesquite, brown grasses rippling in the wind, and the white sand out on the burning plains blurred his eyes, though dark glasses shielded them as he rode down the strays he'd rope and brand. Perhaps this speculation has its source in movies or TV, and then perhaps no one in such a place would easily talk to me or any stranger walking in. Uh, I love the California missions. Uh, I've lived next to the San, the San Diego mission for a long time. But this is called Beneath the Mission Walls. It's a San Luis Obispo mission. Grizzly bears used to come down from the mountains and dig these white roots that are on the banks of the creek just below the uh, mission. Uh, Spaniards didn't put up for that very long. Uh, beneath the mission walls. I love the thick adobe walls, the red tile floors roughened by years of sandals, shoes, boots shuffling over them, and the enclosed courtyard where flowers planted in squares and circles suggest an influence of Spain's Arab architects who built in fluid stone, gorgeous 
geometries of eternity. Year after year returning to this place, I dig through memory beneath these walls, as though my shambling presence, bulked by age, could find some nourishing substance here where my mother, aunts, and uncles knelt beneath a choir loft braced by large, rough human beings. I stand where Spanish archers must have stood before they shot their bolts into the fur of grizzlies digging for the sweet white roots which once grew just beneath the bank's black earth. And this is about the Mission San Miguel, which is about 30 miles up Highway 101. Earthquake, Mission San Miguel. St. Michael's cheek was creased, his breastplate split. Some gorgeous blues had fallen on the floor, their plaster sections powdering underfoot. I dropped loose change in a red coffee can, half full of lustrous quarters, nickels, dimes, washed by some candles flickering through the dark. The sapphire at the center of his shield parted as though a broadsword struck it there. We had been taught St. Michael's dazzling shield could deflect almost anything but now, with painted armor pierced and his shield rent, he seems as helpless as a mortal man. Oh, let us now replaster Michael's wounds, smooth them with trowels like a mother's hands, and brush blue pigment there, so that our myth of warrior angels may retain in this place its visible presence, blue on white walls. I'll read one more poem. Maybe I'll read two more poems. Victor, you've been very patient. Here's a poem about the river walk, and it's a sonnet. A bank of lilies may reflect white scrolls onto the river's marbled green, which rilled by breezes rocks them in a wake, unrolls their rippling parchments, letting the sun-chilled runes briefly print vague capitals of light. Such dazzling appearances might mean nothing despite a fluency of white dots, dashes foaming on the river's glassine exterior, angelic texts which none of us will read or ever comprehend. And if eternity's graved colophon crushes beneath a foot as leaves descend, one would still search the river bank to find it trembling on the margins of the wind. One more poem. This is called My Cap of Darkness. It's a title poem of my next, of my manuscript, my next book. It's got three influences. Ovid, who has Perseus in the Metamorphosis. And Perseus has this cap he puts on that makes him invisible. And also he carries, he's cut Medusa's head off and when he wants to fight somebody, he doesn't. He looks the other way and holds it up, and they turn into stone. Uh, so that's one influence. The other one is the uh, Requiem Mass, Dies Irae, Day of Anger. I love Requiem Masses. <laughs> it makes everyone else sad, but I love them. <laughs> Barre, Mozart, and all those guys. And the third one is influenced by uh, holy, the third section by one of John Donne's holy sonnets. At the rounders, imagine quarters, blow your trumpets, angels, and arise, arise from death, you numberless infinities. And that's it. That's too great a poem. I don't know. <laughs>
my cap of darkness. A photo in a yearbook catches me as I lean nonchalantly on a green bleacher, not posing, cradling a helmet, paint streaked from collisions with running backs. And I remember how on several occasions the whole world went dark for me as our heads butted with a crack, gold lights twinkling on the black velvet of the sky. For a moment, this helmet was a cap of darkness without the capabilities Perseus possessed, letting him move unseen among various enemies. If I could move invisibly among those who discuss my life, my work, I would unsheath a head whose serpentine locks hiss and strike the air above my trembling hand, turning to stone the minds of those who think they see my inner darknesses or gaps of deprivation yawn, widening as they watch. Part two. O oh, day of anger, when eyelids must fall like curtains rippling down, and a vague spot at the back of my skull where a vein blew apart no longer buzzes, when the low pressures elicit thunderheads and bolts, riving the clouds with their white, jagged scars. Then I will feel my cap of darkness pull too tightly down, and I won't see her move loose among the crowds on boulevards, malls, parking lots, wherever my countrymen would gather. And I'll know the time is near when I won't hear spadefuls of dirt drummed down on a wood lid locked just above my head. Three, then sleep until the day gold trumpets blare, hoping you will feel then your bones recoat with skin and some fresh blood flow through your veins, somehow reconstituted as loose dirt drifts from your hair and shoulders, everything suddenly bright, pure air in your new lungs. Then rip your cap of darkness loose and stand, waiting with muscular ease for what must come. Thank you. Great audience. You're terrific. Thank you. <laughs> You're patient. You're good. Thank you. Great reading. Thank you.